Job 13, 13 through 16, the word of God from the King James text today reads, Hold your peace, let me alone, that I may speak, and let come on me what will. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth, and put my life in mine hand? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. For an hypocrite shall not come before him. Hallelujah. Job 13, 13 through 16. We have, in recent days, those of us here in America have borne witness to some awful tragedies. The state of California has one community in particular that was nearly entirely demolished by wildfire. And today there are dozens and dozens and dozens of people who do not have a home, Martin, because their home was burned to ashes. It was reduced to nothing. And many today are looking at what used to be and trying to imagine what today can be because they're in a place that they're going to have to rebuild, not just rebuild their structure, but rebuild their lives from the ground up. If you have never lost virtually everything you own, then you cannot imagine the horror that such an experience brings upon you. Yes. I've been in that place. I won't tell you the whole story. It's long, it's boring, I don't want to take away from the message by going into a long narrative. But there was a time many years ago when I literally lost, I went on a trip, I had a bag packed, I had my Bible, I had my, my old concordance that I won when I was 12 years old in children's Sunday school, you know, in a contest, and clothes, and that's all I had that I brought with me. And before I could get back home and retrieve the rest of my things, I was in the process of relocating and moving, had all my possessions in storage. Everything was gone. Everything. I was left with nothing, literally. You know, you, you stand there sometimes... We tend to define ourselves by our possessions, you know. We tend to define ourselves by what we have. Because human beings are funny. We hold on to stuff that reminds us of important moments in our lives. You know, we take wedding pictures. We take baby pictures, you know. Uh, we, we may hold on to that little outfit that Junior wore when he was just two years old. Of course, Junior now is 54 years old and ain't no way in the world he's ever going to fit back in that little onesie. But we still hold on to it just because when we hold it in our hand, it reminds us of a time. It reminds us of a day long since past. Martin, when all those things go up in smoke, you feel like your life suddenly means nothing. You have nothing to point at. I remember I pastored my first church at the age of 19 in the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee. And I used to keep photos. Back then, you had to take photos and bring them to CBS, you know, wait for them to get developed. Y'all remember that. Yeah. You know, yeah. little bird had to chisel an image into the yeah. stone. You know, <laughs> those of us that are old enough to remember. Kids today don't know nothing but this digital stuff, you know, where they can take a million and one pictures and don't cost them nothing. Well, back in the day, we had to buy film. You had to take it to get it developed, and you had to pay for the developing. And if you wanted more print you had to pay for more prints and all that kind of fun stuff. Well, I wanted a record of 
my first work, because it was my very, very first pastoral uh, assignment, and I wanted a record of it, so I was careful to take a lot of pictures, and I put together a little scrapbook, you know, a little album. <coughs> well, <coughs> as the years passed, again, I won't go into great details, it's lengthy, it's boring, it's not essential to the story. Somewhere along the line, that scrapbook got lost. And Martin, I grieve the loss of that scrapbook to this day. I yeah. still grieve the loss of it. Yeah. Because I put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, put a lot of prayer, put a lot of fasting, put a lot of effort and energy and sacrifice into that work. And I would love to have that scrapbook that I could just look through once in a while and relive in my imagination and in my memory the wonderful experiences that we had as the church grew and as it prospered and as God moved and great things happened. But I don't have that. But when I lost everything all at once, Martin, I suddenly felt naked in the world. I felt like I didn't know who I was. I really didn't. It, it was the weirdest thing. I've told Tommy many, many times that I'm 53, but I feel like I've lived maybe three different, four different lives. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. That there were certain times and certain sections of your life that were almost separate unto themselves. And when you try to remember back, it seems like you're remembering a whole different lifetime, you know, a whole different, well, when my husband was alive and when we were living in this little house, you know, I remember that, but that is one lifetime that I lived. Then there's this other period, you know, and I feel like sometimes I've lived several different lifetimes and I wish I had some record, something to remember, to remind me of what existed and what happened in that particular era and in that particular lifetime. And when you don't have anything, you just feel raped, pardon the term, you feel naked, you feel violated, you feel like you don't even know who you are anymore. Yeah. I understand that kind of loss. I understand today these people in California who've lost their homes to fire, who are starting all over brand new, yeah. who will be asking friends and relatives in days to come if they might have some extra pictures, if they might have a few extra mementos from their wedding or from the birth of their first baby or from this special occasion or that special occasion because they once again want to be able to hold something in their hand that can help to revive the memories right. and help them to relive that experience. Right. Loss is a terrible thing. When we read the story of Job, we read a story of immense and terrible loss. Very few people in this world have ever experienced the kind of losses that Job experienced. Amen. The Word of God tells us also in Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 22. And there was a day when his sons, meaning Job's sons and Job's daughters, were eating and drinking while eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And only I, I only, am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, 
the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee while he was yet speaking. My goodness, this is calamity upon calamity upon... You hadn't even finished getting word of one mess, then you're hearing about another. While he was yet speaking, verse 18, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And only I am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and ripped his mantle, <coughs> and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped. My God, what a time to have church. How many of us, the first thing we do when something happens in our life, we call out a church? How many of us, oh bless God, I had a tough week, I had a tough day, I'm mad at this one, I'm upset with that one, uh, my child and I had a disagreement or an argument, I don't feel like going to church today. My God, Job just got news of calamity upon calamity upon calamity, and Job's first reaction is, it's time to worship God. Hallelujah. My Lord, have mercy. We need to learn, Martin, that when you least feel like it, that's generally when you most need it. Yeah. Yes. Hello now. When you least feel like being in church, that's when you most need to be in church. I remember Sister Zoe Brown in the Church of God. Many years ago, Sister Brown was a Church of God evangelist lady. Hi here. Long sleeves, long dress. She was in her 80s. She loved to talk about the fact, Lisa, that her teeth were her own and her hair was her own. She said, when you look at this pile of hair on my head, it's my hair. I don't have a hair piece of not wearing a wig. That's all mine. And she was a marvelous saint of God. Well, doctors had told her she was in awful shape. Here she was in her 80s. She was in terrible shape, very ill. They said the best thing you can do is stay home and rest and do nothing and go nowhere because if you're not careful, this could easily take you out of this world. Well, we were having camp meeting. And Sister Brown was at the campground because she'd come for camp meeting. So at the beginning of the evening service, the Overseer announced that Sister Brown would not be in service. She was very, very ill. The doctors have told her that if she isn't extremely careful and very cautious that this sickness could take her life. And as the overseer was talking, here comes Sister Brown. <laughs> Had a big old blanket wrapped around her, Martin. Here she come walking into that old tabernacle at the Church of God camp meeting grounds in uh, Weatherford, Texas, and she walked down the center aisle with that thing wrapped around her. She got in her seat, because you know how it is, them old timers. They got a seat, honey. Yeah. That's right. They got their yeah, place, right. and you know, if you don't see them in that place, something's up. And the overseer said, well, Sister Brown, I thought the doctor said, she said, I don't care what the doctor said. It's time to be in church. It's time for camp meeting. There's not a devil in hell going to keep me out of the house of God. Amen. I'm going to tell you something. By the time that service was done, <laughs> Sister Brown had shed her her uh, uh, blanket that she come in with, and she was dancing and shouting across the front of that building and giving God the glory. Hallelujah. She lived for years after that. Sometimes when you least feel like worshiping, 
That's when you need to worship. Yes, amen. Sometimes when you least feel like praying, it's when you need to pray. Sometimes when you least feel like being in the house of God, Job teaches us it's time to go to church. I'm going to tell you something. I, I grew up old-fashioned. If I ain't dead, I'll be here. <laughs> well, what if you're dying? Well, dying is one thing. It ain't bad enough. If I ain't dead, I'm going to be here. When I was pastoring in Connecticut, my home state, they put me in the hospital with a, a parasite in my gut that was killing me, literally. I was losing weight left and right, and they kept saying, do you know that you may die? I said, uh-huh. Yep, mm -hmm. okay. They had me on IV treatment. I told the doctor, I said, listen, I'm pa I pastor a little new work over here in New Haven. I need to get out of here on Sunday because if I'm not there, they ain't got nobody to preach. They don't have anybody to conduct the service. He said, well, they can do without you for one Sunday. I said, no, they can't. My job is to preach the gospel. If I don't have somebody to fill in for me, then by God, I'll be there. Well, but we cannot let you out. We can't do that because you're, you're really not supposed to interrupt your treatment. I said, listen, Doc, here's how this is going to play out. <laughs> you don't ever want to go head to head with me because I promise you I'm going to win. I said, either you find a way to get me out of here on Sunday in time for me to go to church and preach, I'll come back. But either you find a way or I'm going to sign myself out AMA. Because my priorities are God first and everything else last. That includes my own life, if need be. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable servant. If I die preaching the gospel, then I will have died in the most honorable way possible. There's not a single soldier that's ever gone down on a battlefield who will have died a more honorable death than a man of God who dies doing the work of God, trying to help souls find their way to heaven. Hello, Amen. man. Amen. I said, I'm going to be in church. He said, all right, all right, all right, you stubborn old thing. I've had more doctors tell me that I'm stubborn. I want to hospitalize Lisa the summer of 2003 times over the course of that summer. Twice for one week, once for two weeks. Each and every time I demanded that I be released on Sunday so I could preach. Every single time. And they agreed. I did my job. When I get to heaven, I'm not going to be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, I did you some big favor. No, the word of God said no. The master's going to look at you and say, you did what you were asked to do. See, preachers love to brag about themselves and brag about what all they've done. They don't understand. Honey, all you've done is what God called you to do. You ain't got no bragging rights in the world. Your pride does not serve you well. You ought to remain humble because God called you to preach. God called you to do the work of God. And whatever you got to do to do what God's called you to do, that's just what you got to do. Hello now. Amen. Don't expect a special trophy in heaven for extra effort. You will not get extra credit. No. That's what God expects. He expects people to be faithful. He expects his people to be consistent. Here's Job receiving word upon word upon word of calamity and he immediately falls down upon the ground in verse 20 Job chapter 1 and worships and he said talk about somebody that kept his spiritual priorities in line naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Ooh. Most of us 
stuff comes our way and calamity comes what we perceive as calamity and of course for some of us drama queens it don't take a whole lot you misplace your mascara and dear god have mercy you'd have thought the world come to an end and an atomic bomb just went off some of these folks in our world today but Job had his priorities right. He understood what he believed. He said, no, I come into this thing without anything, and I'm going to leave this thing without anything. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Lord, I have no complaints. Most of us, Lisa, the first words off our lips is, what's happening? Lord, what's, what's happening? What, what's going on, Lord? Why is this happening to me? Why is this going on? Lord, why are you allowing this in my Oh, Lord, why is the devil attacking me? So I'm so tired of Christians ascribing to the enemy power and authority that he does not have. I've cast demons out of a lot of people in my life. Yeah, I'm old-time Pentecost. I believe in demons. I believe they're real. I also believe that those things quake at the name of Jesus. Amen. And they don't have a hope in hell of standing in the face of a child of God who speaks in authority and with faith the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I Amen. believe that with everything I've got. But I've had more people come to me complaining I need deliverance. I need deliverance. Oh, brother, I'll tell you, I've been under a curse. Oh, brother, i got to tell you, the devil just been tearing me up one side down the other. Oh, I just need, I need you to lay hands on me and pray for me. I say, no, you don't. You need to start coming to church and getting the word in you because your thinking and your doctrine is all messed up. And they look at me like I'm talking in tongues. They don't understand the word. I'm saying, what? said, honey, you need to get your teaching right. Let me tell you a little secret. Let me tell you a truth. The Bible said you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Let me tell you the truth. The devil hasn't got one ounce of authority, one ounce of power in the life of a child of God. Amen. The devil can't touch you with a thousand foot pole. There is not a thing in the world the enemy can bring against you. Now, the unbeliever, he can have a heyday with them. But a believer, oh, no, 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 no. No, you're talking about a whole different dynamic when you start talking about God's people. The Bible said we're the apple of his eye. And I'm going to tell you something. The devil ain't stupid enough to poke God in the eye. He don't mess with God's people. No, 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 no. When you understand the authority and the power of the Word of God said, Jesus gave them power to tread upon serpents. My God have mercy. The devil hadn't got no more power in your life than anything. That's right. If you're a child of God, my Bible said the angels of God encamp round about them that fear him. Am I telling the truth? Amen. Honey, I got a whole, I got a whole encampment of angels around me. The devil has no access. So quit blaming the devil for every bad thing comes at you. The devil didn't send it. The devil hasn't got the power to bring it. Ooh, some people say, no, I've never heard that. My pastor don't preach that. Well, that's the problem. He should. <laughs> Listen. Let me finish Job 1, verse 22. After he said, the Lord giveth, the Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Job never brought accusation against God for everything that had just happened to him. How many of us look up toward heaven and say, Lord, what's happening? Why did you do this? Why are you allowing this? Now let's look at Job 1, verses 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God, angels, 
came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath in thy power, only a, excuse me, uh, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. The devil didn't start the conversation about Job. God did. God was bragging about Job. And the enemy looked at the Lord and said, Lord, you put a hedge around him. The reason he think so highly of you and he fears you is because I can't get anywhere near him. You've got him fully protected. Child of God, understand me today. You're fully protected. Hallelujah. The angels of the Lord are camped round about you. The devil doesn't have the power nor the authority to come against you. Amen. He's got to get permission to do anything he does. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Any calamity that comes into your life, the enemy has to get permission from God to bring that calamity. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So quit acting like God is impotent. Quit acting like God has somehow uh, conceded his power in your life and blaming the devil for stuff that comes against you. No, God has allowed it. God has permitted it. There is a higher purpose at work. Hallelujah. Be like Job and worship God anyhow. Be like Job and have your priorities right. Be like Job and understand stuff comes and stuff goes. But I'm going to bless it anyway. Hallelujah. Be like Job and understand today that God is in control. I'm going to tell you, it makes me a whole lot happier when things are going bad. And lately, I've had a lot of stuff going kind of crazy in my life, in my body. I can say, oh, the enemy's coming against me. The enemy, no, he's not. I'm giving the enemy power when I say that. No, no, no. God is in control of this life. Anything coming into this life is there because God is permitting it. And I got news for you. God don't permit nothing that isn't going to work for my good in the long run. God doesn't permit anything that isn't ultimately going to help elevate me and help me achieve a higher plane than I've ever before known. Hallelujah. All things work together for good to them that love God, who are the called according to his purpose. Either the word of God is true or it's a lie. I believe it's true. So cancer diagnosis. <laughs> Whoop de doo. See, a lot of us know how to worship God when everything's going good, but when things go bad, all of a sudden our tune changes. 
A lot of us know how to give God a shout when we're up on the mountaintop. But bless the Lord, we haven't got a shout within a mile of us when we get down into the valley. But our primary text today said, Job was speaking, you know, we've always got people around us have lots to say about our situation. <laughs> Job yeah. was surrounded by people who had lots to say about his situation. But in our primary text today, Job said, hold your peace. Let me be alone that I may speak and let come on me what will. Job, man, are you a brave soul. You've already lost about everything you've got, and then you have the nerve to say, I'll let the devil throw anything at me he wants to throw at me. My Lord, most of us begging and pleading God, all right, Lord, you can stop now. All right, Lord, you can stop now. No more, Lord, Lord, please, I can't take any more. I hate to admit it, but I've been guilty of that phrase a time or two in my whole life, haven't you? Might as well be honest with me. Yeah. Don't stand here looking like a bunch of liars. Oh, no, brother, I've never told the Lord I've had enough. Because I know you're fitting. I've done it myself, Lord. I think I've reached my point. I think I've reached that point where I can't take a, another straw. One more piece of straw and this old camel's back will be broken. Have you ever been there? Yeah. You ever feel like you're standing there, Lord? What? What's happening? What's happening? I, I don't understand what's happening. A child of God should never have to ask that question. Mm -hmm. Because we know the answer before we ask what's happening. God is permitting something in our life that ultimately is going to be for our betterment and our good. That's what's happening. Mm -hmm. Period. Case closed. The devil ain't attacking you. The devil hasn't got power over you. No, that's not what's happening. What's happening is God is permitting something that is going to sharpen your blade, hallelujah, that is going to sharpen the head of your axe. You know what the Word of God says sharpens the head of the axe? Let's put it this way. It ain't soft and cushy. <laughs> You're going to sharpen the head of an axe, honey. You better have something sharper than the head of the axe. You better have a flint. You better have something that's abrasive. You better have something that's aggressive. You better have something that is hard. Say, why am I going through this? What's happening, Lord? Uh, your axe head is getting sharpened. The blade of your sword is getting sharpened. You are being recreated and remade into something better than you were. That's what's happening. Job said, Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He said, I'm going to watch how I react to things. I'm going to watch how I respond to situations in my life because I've been running around telling people I'm a believer. I've been running around telling people I was a child of God. And that worked out beautifully when everything in my life was grand and glorious. That was wonderful when my marriage was going well and I lived in a beautiful house and I could afford to make my car payments and my husband had a good job. And oh, I, I could tell people then I was a child of God. I could tell people then I was a uh, an heir to the kingdom. Oh, I could just brag about my Christianity then. But then calamity came. My husband lost his job. We couldn't afford to make the car payments. I lost my house. All of a sudden, we're running around cussing and carrying on and swearing at God and getting mad at God and asking, Lord, what's happening? Job said, you won't see me doing that. No, because if I do that, I've become a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. See, all these years I bragged about believing all these things. And yet, when the rubber met the road, I didn't act like I really believed them. Ooh, preacher, how many Christians do that? 
When everything's going good, oh, we brag. We get up in church and testify. I thank God. He's so wonderful. Oh, praise God. Everything's grand and glorious. And then something happens that we didn't expect. I'm going to tell you something. When they tell you a doctor sit, sitting in front of you telling you got cancer, when they tell you that that strikes you right in the head, you know, like a sledgehammer, they're not joking. Last words I ever dreamed in a million years I was going to hear a doctor say to me is, you've got cancer. I, I didn't expect that for nothing in the world. I said, Lord, i got enough going on in my life. That I sure enough wasn't that surprising me. That caught me off guard. <laughs> you better believe it. But you know what, Lisa? I can either continue to walk by faith, I can continue to walk after the Spirit, I can continue to walk the way a child of God walks, believe in God and trust in Him that He knows what He's doing, or I can start accusing God of letting the devil have power in my life. I can start accusing God of seceding some of His authority and some of His power in my life. No, 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 no. I won't keep walking the way I was walking before calamity came. Hello now. Because... A hypocrite will not stand before God. I refuse to be a hypocrite. I refuse. No, I've been claiming that I live this life of faith. I've been claiming that I walk by faith and not by sight. And if I've been claiming that when things were grand, guess what? I better live up to it when things aren't so grand. Amen. The most notable word... Spoken by Job in the midst of all his trials was the word he. Job recognized that his life was securely in the hand of God. He knew that whatever befell him, it was ordained by God. He did not blame the enemy. He didn't accuse Satan of vexing him. Satan is the agency whereby the will of God is sometimes carried out. But in the end, all things must pass before the Lord before even the devil can try to afflict a child of God. Did you hear what I said now? Yeah. Hallelujah. The most powerful word Job spoke, the most powerful word that Job understood, Martin, was he. Say, preacher, I don't quite understand what you're saying. Well, let me remind you. Excuse me. In verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, Yet will I trust in him, though he slay me. See, Job didn't say, though the devil slay me. Right. Though the enemy slay me, I'm still going to trust God. No, no, no. Job understood. Mm -hmm. God is still in control of my life. Everything that is happening is happening because God is working his divine plan. Oh, I hope you're hearing me today. Everything that I've lost, everything that I've experienced, every calamity that I have faced, I am facing because God is doing something wonderful. Hallelujah! In my life! Amen. How can you look at calamity and understand that there's something wonderful on the other side of that calamity? Well, if you're not walking in the Spirit, you can't. <laughs> but when you walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, when you walk by faith and not by sight, then you understand the promise of God is this. All things work together for good to them who love God, who are the called according to His purpose. That's the promise of God. And that means that this situation I'm facing today is going to work out okay. This dilemma that I have learned of today 
it's going to end in victory. Look again at what Job said in our primary text today. He said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation. He said, he may be allowing me to go through calamity today, but he's going to be my redeemer, my salvation, and my restorer tomorrow. Hallelujah. He also shall be my salvation. Listen, if God is still on, in, on the throne, if he's still in charge of your life today, then whatever the calamity, whatever the trouble, whatever the trial, whatever the loss, know this. He also will be your salvation. He also is going to be the one to bring you through. He's also going to be the one to restore you. He's also going to be the one to reconcile you. He's also going to be the one to declare the year of Jubilee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When all that is lost must be restored. <laughs> Glory to God. Woo. Well, I wish I had a little more energy today so I could <laughs> preach. I hate being so energyless. Trying to preach the word of God. Amen. Too many people today want to accuse the enemy of vexation without cause. When trouble comes their way. All that is good they attribute to God, and all that is bad they ascribe to Satan. But as children of God, we must recognize that every moment, every situation is in God's hand. And it's at the Lord's direction. Satan has no power over the children of the Almighty. He must obtain permission to even touch the life of a believer. But just as Job, we must live what we profess and be prepared to face the fiery furnace, expecting to come out on the other side victorious and blessed. But even if our present situation is meant to usher us into the glory of God's presence, we ought still to be prepared to declare, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Romans 8, 28, I've been quoting it today over and over again. And we know, Paul said, hallelujah, it's one thing, Lisa, to quote, all things work together for good. It's one thing to quote that. But don't forget the first four words. And we know that. And we know that. I don't believe all things work together for good. We know that all things work together for good. There's a world of difference between believing something and knowing something. Amen. Hallelujah. I know that all things work together for good Amen. to them that love God. Amen. Who are the called according to his purpose. We know that. Why are we even bothering to ask God what's happening? We know all things work together. For good. We know that God has promised us this. My God have mercy. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. There hath no temptation. That means trial, persecution, trouble. There hath no temptation taken you. But such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Oh, hallelujah. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. God will not allow anything come on you that is more powerful than you. God will not allow anything in your life that he does not have the confidence that you can make it through. God will not allow the enemy to even test you or try you with something that has the ability to overthrow you. No, 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 no. No. No, God didn't push you beyond your limits. 
Now listen to me. He may push you to your limit. Mm -hmm. He may push you further than you thought you could go. I remember when I was a kid, growing up, and I played Little League Baseball. My coach said, I want you to play first base. I said, I don't think I can play first base. He said, I do. Get on first base. Tried to give me a first baseman's glove. You know, a first baseman's glove is a very strange little booger. It's padded on two sides. It's like a big clam. And uh, you got your pocket in the middle. I hated that first baseman's glove. Man, that thing was uncomfortable. I couldn't work with that. I said, let me wear my outfielder's glove. He said, nobody plays first base with an outfielder's glove. I said, well, let me try. He let me play first base with an outfielder's glove. And let me tell you, I'm not kidding. You couldn't throw a ball that I'd miss. You could not throw something at me and have me miss it. Lisa, I was catching everything that they threw. If it was way off, I still would run and jump and get it. That outfielder's glove, see, I knew how to work that outfielder's glove. I was comfortable with that. But you know what? I'd have never in a million years stood on first base. I'd have never in a million years thought I could do it. But my coach knew I could. So God may allow us at times to be pushed to our limit. And our limit may be on what we perceive our limit to be. We may think, no, Lord, that's beyond my ability. That's beyond my limit. I can't go that far. And the coach is saying, oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. And you know what? There is nothing more exciting than conquering something you never thought you could do. Hello now. There is nothing so exciting as finding out that you have abilities that you never even knew you had. And the only reason you discovered them is because somebody else believed in you more than you believed in yourself. I got news for you today, children. God believes in you more than you believe in yourself. So there are going to be times when he's going to allow the enemy to bring some stuff in your direction. Because he's trying to help you flex that faith muscle. Your faith isn't going to grow. Your faith isn't going to become more today than it was yesterday if it's never tested and tried. If you never face any kind of opposition, <coughs> then your faith will forever and always remain exactly what it always has been. I don't know about you, but I want my faith to grow. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to be able to believe God for greater things. I want to be able to believe God in the midst of greater calamity and greater trouble. Why? Because life's uncertain. What I perceive as the greatest trial I've ever been through yesterday may not be the greatest trial I ever go through. Hello now. So I want to be prepared for the greater trial when it comes. I've said it before and I'll say it again. You don't want to start looking for faith to believe God for something after that circumstance or that situation has come upon you. You don't ever want to be in the position to have to try to find your faith after you're in the lion's den. After you're in the burning, fiery furnace. No, you better have your faith in your back pocket long before you get in the fiery furnace. Long before you get in the lion's den. You better have that faith there, baby. And it better be ready. You better be ready to pull it out and use it. When I was dying in 2000 and I wound up in the hospital for two solid months on life support for a month. If I was going to have to find faith to believe God for a miracle while I was in that situation, I'd have been in an awful mess. Because, sweetheart, I didn't have the strength. I didn't have the stamina. I didn't have the energy to believe God for nothing in and of myself. But guess what? I had already established, I had already determined in my heart, in my mind, in my soul that God was a healer and he was a deliverer. And when the opportunity came for my faith to grab hold of that promise, guess what? I didn't have to search for it. I didn't have to try to find it somewhere. No, baby, I had it in my back pocket. I pulled it out and said, all right, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle. I'm believing you for a miracle. Let's get this done. It was as simple as that. Because I already had the faith stored up. 
You don't want to wait till you're going through a trial to find the faith to believe God. A lot of Christians today mistakenly think that Satan and his minions were celebrating the death of the Lord Jesus Christ as he hung on the cross of Calvary. Many Christians falsely believe that the corridors of hell were uproarious with laughter and rejoicing as the Lord Jesus Christ hung up on the cross of Calvary. But Satan had tried often to end the Lord's life long before that trial before Herod and Pilate. He sought to end the Lord's life as an infant, as Herod offered, uh, ordered the slaughter of all males under the age of two. He tried to encourage the Lord to purposely fall from atop the pinnacle of the temple as he tempted Jesus during his 40-day fast in the wilderness. He tried Martin to get the Jewish elders to stone the Lord as he made statements which clearly hinted at his divinity and eternal nature. Got news for you today, children. Hell was not rejoicing as Christ hung on the cross of Calvary. Not by a stretch. Hell was on lockdown. They were preparing for a full-out assault as the Son of Man would soon descend into the pit to lead captivity captive and release the souls of all God's saints who had lived before the redeeming death of the Messiah and Savior. Hallelujah. Say, Pastor, that's all well and good. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to tell you today, God has a plan for your life. He knows what he's doing. Nothing that comes your way is by happenstance or sheer dumb luck. The Lord is working His plan. My God have mercy. Nothing is meant to destroy or demolish, but rather only to refine and reveal. Hallelujah, child of God. I know what's happening, and I know why it's happening. Because my God wills it. And because it will in the end bring blessing and not a curse. It will result in restoration, Martin, not in rubble. Almost done today. Job 42, the end of the book, verses 10 through 17. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. Hallelujah. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camel, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she-asses. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And instead of giving you the names, because that's just going to take time, I don't want to take, verse 15. And in all the land were no woman found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this lived Job an hundred and forty years, and saw his sons and his sons' sons 
even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. You know, I'm 53 now, and this church is nowhere near what I'd like it to be. I've been ministering in the area I've been ministering now for an awful lot of years. I, I, I wish to God we had three or 400 people in this place today. That would tickle me to death. I'm going to tell you something. We'd be shouting and running the aisles. Y'all could sit there as quiet as you want to. But the rest of us going to get happy around here. I promise you that. This old preacher, I, I'm not going to be satisfied till we go to church where the power of God is moving and the Holy Ghost is flowing and where people know how to dance and shout and rejoice in the Holy Ghost because that's the way I believe God wants His church to worship. Amen. But I'm going to tell you something. No, things aren't where they like to be. And I... I sure have been getting a lot of bad news as of late. Sometimes I say, Lord, I'm too old for you to be letting me go through all this. Good Lord, how long can I live? Even if everything, even if you healed me and delivered me and turned everything around tomorrow, how many years would I have to enjoy the better days and the better times? Well, I got news for you, Martin. God's also in control of how old you die at. Lord says, don't you stand there and tell me how much longer could you have. I could make you live to be 120, have perfect health till the day you die, and you can be enjoying another 67 years for all you know. I'm God. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm God. Don't put, don't put your timetable on me. Don't try to attach your timetable. Don't be like a child and stand there and impetuously tell me, Lord, I'm too old. You better hurry up if you're going to fix this thing. You better hurry up if you're going to make it right. I won't have a lot of time to enjoy the good things. No, look at Job. God restored him and then turned around and allowed Job to live 140 years. So Job got to enjoy that time of restoration. He got to enjoy four generations of his family after he had lost everything. Can you imagine? When his life literally had to restart, he had to start brand new with infants, and they had to grow to adulthood, and God allowed him to live four generations after the restoration. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? Oh, don't worry about it. God knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. He's working all things for your good. Lastly, today I want to read to you Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. I love this passage so much. God speaks through the prophet Jeremiah and said, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now I'm going to read that to you in the NIV to help you understand it a little bit better. The NIV, Jeremiah 29, 11 said, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. <laughs> Hallelujah. What's happening? What's happening, Lord? Why all the calamity? Why all the struggle? Why all the trouble? Why the sickness? Why the disease? Why are these things coming my way? And God's answer is, because I have a plan. And I have a purpose. And if you'll just worship me, if you'll just continue to worship me, if you'll continue to believe me, you believe me in the good times, then believe me in the bad. Hallelujah. You believe me when everything was wonderful. Now believe me when everything's terrible. Because just like Job, I'm able to restore. Just like Job, I'm able to heal. Just like Job, I'm able to deliver. Just like Job, I'm able to give you a far better end than you even had before all this started. Don't, don't become a hypocrite. Don't suddenly start living something different than you've been talking. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. Don't start living something different than you've been talking. No, keep walking the walk you've been talking. Because a hypocrite will not stand before me. And I promise you, all things work together for good to them that love God. 
who are the called according to his purpose. Martin.